Have you ever considered the intricate role that technology plays in the domain of defence and security? Well, in today's rapidly evolving world where threats are not just physical but digital as well, how do defence giants like BAE Systems stay ahead of the curve? Well, joining me on Tech Talks Daily is Rob Merriweather, Technology Director at BAE Systems. We're going to explore the fascinating realm of multi-domain integration in battlefield scenarios and also how BAE Systems is leveraging data-led capabilities to provide a comprehensive intelligence picture. But the focus today is about quantum technology and how quantum technology is not just shaping, but it's revolutionising the work they're doing there. So prepare for a discussion that unveils the tech behind the scenes and the future of defence in an increasingly interconnected world. And as regular listeners will know, something I'm very passionate about on this podcast is busting a few myths, misconceptions, stereotypes, and all those things that we immediately think of. Now, I know for most people listening, you may think of BAE Systems being a massive defence company that is more in the business of building ships and submarines and anything to do with technology. But I want to learn more about how it also has some serious technology credentials and is involved in a lot of groundbreaking work in this space. Now, before I get today's guest on, a quick shout out to the sponsors of Tech Talks Daily, because in today's remote first world, I think settling for outdated managed file transfer solutions means ultimately you're risking your sensitive data. But if you upgrade to KiteWorks, the gold standard in secure MFT, boasting FedRAMP moderate authorization, KiteWorks isn't just secure, it's a complete transformation of how your business handles file transfers and the communications. And with this state-of-the-art file sharing, email security, and and a platform that's as robust as it is user-friendly, KiteWorks is empowering you to manage and protect your data like never before. So say goodbye to compromise and hello to unmatched security and efficiency. And you can do that by making the switch to KiteWorks.com. Visit KiteWorks.com, that's KiteWorks.com, to secure your data and empower your business. But now, let's get today's guest on. So buckle up and hold on tight, because no matter where you're listening in the world, I'm going to be beaming your ears directly into the UK, where you can join us in this conversation. So a massive warm welcome to the show. Can you tell everyone listening a little about who you are and what you do? Yeah, thanks. Uh, So I'm Rob Merriweather. Uh, I'm the Group Technology Director at uh, BA Systems. What I do look really across our business um, and try and understand yeah, the market trends, what our future customers are going to need, and what that means in terms of the products that we need to be able to offer and then the underpinning technologies uh, that we need to be learning about developing, maturing, and using uh, within our company to, to give our customers the capabilities that they need. Well, there's so much I'm looking forward to talking with you about, in particular, quantum computing. It's a subject that divides so many different people that even just defining what quantum computing is can cause uh, disagreements in the tech community. But to begin with, can you set the scene by elaborating on how quantum sensors are actually already revolutionising things like navigation and anti-submarine warfare? And also, how do they compare in accuracy and reliability to current GPS systems? Because this isn't technology of the future. It's already here, isn't it? It is. I mean, you've you've covered um, a a, a massive range, even within the introduction of of that question. Um, I think if we look at quantum technologies in the round, um, there are a a broad range of things that we we probably need to think about and consider. So you've mentioned computing, you've mentioned sensing. um, There's also quantum networking, quantum communications, quantum uh, encryption. There's there's a whole range. And I guess to kind of level set it, probably start with what do we mean by quantum in this context? It's really technologies that exploit the properties of individual atomic and subatomic particles so you know down at the atomic level and that makes it really hard one to do two to understand but it opens up some really interesting phenomena that we can we can exploit in in technology and so i guess out of the the range of things that you talked about there if i if i pick on quantum sensing first um and you you talked about anti-submarine warfare it's it's a really interesting uh topic because 
fundamentally the benefit that submarines have in in you know in military organizations is that they're stealthy you know they're underwater they're really hard to see it's hard to know where they are and that's why there's so much secrecy around um you know the submarine enterprise in in the round and if you look at quantum sensors yeah two two of those sensors there's there's a a, a grouping around um magnetometry so that detects changes in the earth's magnetic field um, and there's there's a, a grouping around gravitometry, so things that detect anomalies in in gravitational fields. And yeah, submarines are made out of metal, so they impact um, yeah the magnetic field, and they're quite heavy, so they impact the the gravitational fields. And that kind of leads to this perception of uh, actually, yeah, is there the potential for these quantum sensors to make the stealth of submarines obsolete? Um, I think the you know the the reassuring thing from our perspective and from our customers' perspective is not not really, um, but they do have the the ability to change how we operate in that domain. So, um, yeah, detecting gravity uh, gravitational changes. Um, there's always with anything, and quantum technologies aren't immune to this. Yeah, there's trade spaces between how big the sensor is, how sensitive it is, what range it operates at. So these things do have the ability to detect, you know, uh, an object moving, you know, a, a mile away um, in terms of, you know, its its impact on on the gravitational field. Equally, they have the same in in the magnetic fields. Um, but in the context of you know what we look at, the ocean is a really big place. So those kinds of ranges, whilst they allow you to detect something, you kind of need to know where you're looking. Um, and if you look at you know conventional technologies that we have, like active sonar boys, where we put a sound pulse into the water, we listen for reflections coming off that, we can perform those kind of detection capabilities now. So they will change how how things operate in, in that environment, and I probably won't go into too much detail as to exactly how. But I'd put it more in the context of you know, the evolution of something like radar at the end of or during World War II, where radar allowed us to detect aircraft at longer ranges. That changed the tactics and the operation of, of how things like the Battle of Britain were fought. Um, but it didn't make aircraft obsolete in the battle space. Um, and I think if you look at the, the interaction between quantum sensing and anti-submarine warfare, you're probably seeing a similar dynamic, that it will change the tactics, it will have an impact on how these these systems operate, um, but it isn't going to kind of fundamentally make things, you know, obsolete or or remove their 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 position in the in the force mix. And just to drill down to that a little more, I, how is quantum computing transforming things like research, development, and production processes within the defence industry? And obviously, I understand you're extremely limited as to what you can share around this. But are you able to share any use cases, examples, etc., of how it it's impacting the supply chain. So quantum computing is a fundamentally different way of performing computing functions. Uh, classical computing works on bits and bytes, zeros and ones. Um, and as you build up the number of bits, you can build up the complexity of um, the message that you can represent. So one bit can be in two states, a zero or a one. Uh, two bits could be in four states, zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, one. Three bits in nine states, etc. Qubits, quantum bits, uh, can represent um, both states simultaneously. So what that means is, um, if I have uh, two conventional bits, I can represent four states, but in qubits, I can represent two to the power of four states. And with three bits, I can represent two to the power of nine states. So you get this massive exponential uh, exponential growth and to, to put that in context, by the time you get to 277 qubits, you've actually got the ability to represent more states than there are observable atoms in the universe. So you're, you're actually moving into you know, genuinely mind-blowing levels of, of computing power. So on principle, that sounds incredibly powerful, and it is, um, but it applies far more in certain types of computing than it does in others. So you don't get the benefits on all tasks. So it's about matching quantum computing to particular tasks. Two areas where it's incredibly powerful are factorizing really large numbers, um, and that plays into encryption and code breaking, and also modeling 
physical systems which um, mimic that kind of quantum construction. So fundamental chemistry, uh, electromagnetic performance and behavior of materials, these kinds of um, modeling challenges are um, you know, where it's, it's really, really powerful. Now, we need to put both of those in the context that quantum computing is still relatively immature. Um, it's it's not robust as a process. The the processes aren't stable over time yet. They're getting there, um, and they, they're there to the level that you can now start to perform useful functions. And I think the places where we are seeing the biggest impact is really around some of those materials modeling processes, um, because you don't need to do them real time. So if the process fails, you can rerun it um, and you can you know, run it a few times until you get a sensible result out of the, the early quantum computing. It's changing how we write algorithms to optimize those, these, these kinds of processes because quantum computers effectively speak a different language to classical computers. So we need to program them in different ways. Um, and we're seeing a lot of work going on around how to generate algorithms in a way that are sympathetic to quantum computers to get the most value out of them. Um, but I think you know, seeing an acceleration in the development of bespoke materials, I think, is an area that quantum computing is is starting to show real promise and potential. Today, we need to hypothesize what the properties of a material will be. We can model it in some crude fashion, uh, but then we need to manufacture and test that material or that coating. Uh, quantum computing gives us the promise of being able to do a lot more of that in the digital and synthetic world so we can do it a lot faster so we can get better outcomes. Um, and then the other area that I talked about is is in the, the cryptography and the code-breaking uh, world. And that's more a case of a the code-breaking is a future capability, um, but it's a very real and plausible and probable one, and that has implications now because whilst... Um, you know, information might still be safe in the in the with the cryptography that is is being applied. You start to open up the potential that this information could be um, captured now, although it can't be um, it can't be deciphered. But at some future point, quantum computers may allow that cryptography to be um, to be broken, which then starts to drive a need to update the cryptography capabilities now. And we're seeing a lot of work in the supply chain about new methods of, of cryptography to make these um, this kind of information quantum secure in the future. But it's very much about future proofing against a challenge that we expect to face um, within a period of time rather than something that is achievable now. But because of the nature of the information and the nature of the challenge, it's very much driving changes in behavior in the supply chain now as to the technologies and the capabilities that are being developed. And as this is the first time we've talked about this in, what, 2,600 interviews, you've seriously opened up my curiosity here. So in what ways do quantum technologies provide a competitive advantage in military operations? How do they enhance the capabilities of defence forces when compared to traditional technologies? Because it's one of those things we never get to talk about. Um, a, a lot of it is just higher performance on the same things. So if I take quantum um, navigation, so in uh, inertial measurement units, devices that allow you to do navigation by, by dead reckoning, so how far have I moved from where I knew I was an hour ago? Um, conventional IMUs, inertial measurement units, uh, drift over time, and, and the rate of drift increases with time, so you get this kind of doubling of, of, the, of the effect. Um, if you looked at an aircraft flying complex uh, flight patterns, an IMU might drift, you know, a couple of miles in position um, with with an hour of flight by conventional technologies. We're starting to see uh, quite clear paths. I'm not saying we could achieve this today, but quite clear paths to bringing that down to maybe a few hundred meters over over an hour. And then there's theoretical paths within you know, the physics of the quantum technologies that could allow you to bring that down potentially to even tens of meters. Um, and what that means in an operational context is you no longer have to be dependent on things like uh, GPS navigation, which our adversaries can jam or spoof or trick you into thinking you're somewhere where you're not. If your ability to know where you are is completely self-contained within your asset, then it's far more difficult to disrupt that. Um, and it's probably also worth noting that 
that example I've given around you know aircraft flying complex flight patterns is probably the hardest challenge to resolve from a military perspective. If you're on you know a boat or a submarine or a land vehicle that's maybe moving much more two dimensionally and you know um, more slowly and in more gradual um, patterns, then you know the IMUs perform better. So again, you get to the potential for even better dead reckoning performance out of quantum technologies from the numbers that I was just talking about. Um, so that's a you know a navigation example. Um, I think on on sensing, you know the 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 electro optic sensors. You know we used to cameras and low light cameras today that can go down to kind of starlight levels. So no moon on a clear sky. Um, but you know quantum sensors. There's there's technologies like uh, single photon avalanche diodes. They 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 can receive a single photon of light and then recreate larger numbers of photons off the back of that. Um, which then allow you to extract some meaningful information from the scene. So, yeah, massive increases in the sensitivity that we can we can see. So you can see further in lower light conditions, um, and and there's knock on capabilities that things like that open up. Um, so autonomy, for example, you need to be able to sense the world around you for an autonomous vehicle to be able to navigate. One of the technologies that's really useful for that is something called LIDAR, uh, which is where you use lasers, which is the L, um, in a a radar-type environment. So you send out beams of light and you monitor the reflections. They're really good at monitoring the world around you, but they emit a lot of light. So from a a, a military perspective, um, yeah, they're not particularly stealthy. Uh, Quantum sensing on the receiving side of that opens up the potential to release really tiny amounts of light but still be able to use the reflections to understand the world around you. So you kind of increase stealth. So that's just a few examples, but they're the the kind of areas where they just allow you to move into higher performance parameters in what are currently understood in conventional um, kind of methods or, t- or techniques or sensors. Um, but the operational effect of that can be really quite significant. And if we were to further dig deeper on that one, Matt, how does quantum computing also address things like computational challenges that might arise from multi-domain inte- integration and the, the management of large fleets of autonomous vehicles, etc.? Um, so that one, I actually think, for quantum computing is is probably a little bit further off because yeah. when you start to manage um, big fleets of autonomous vehicles, for example, you need the computing process to happen at the edge. You need the vehicle to be able to do the computing to understand where it is, where other vehicles around it are, how they're performing and how they're interacting to coordinate themselves. Um, you know, similar models to how you see you know, starlings with um, you know, the big flocks flying. You see these behaviours emerge, but they're not centrally coordinated. They're managed because each each bird in that instance is you know, operate to, to according to a set of rules. Um, and the computing that you need to coordinate that needs to be on board the platform. Now, quantum computing is a long way away from being able to be small, robust, deployable into, you know, kind of small platform environments. It's going to be in, in large um, kind of data center environments. And whilst you can do that optimization there, that means you would need to have incredibly good network bandwidth for everything to report its position back to that central location for everything to come out. And you know, history and, and, and practical kind of um, experience has told us that that's not sustainable in a, a contested environment. So um, I think the direct impact is is limited. However, where quantum computing can really play a role is it can massively increase the ability of or our ability to develop those algorithms and those autonomous behaviors in, a, in an optimal way. So we can create far more intelligent behavioral mechanisms, which can then be implemented through conventional computing. But the training has happened in a quantum computing environment. Um, and, and that's where I think it will have a role to play in that multi-domain integration and that kind of operation of, of large swarms of, of vehicles. It won't be directly computing and controlling the interfaces, but I think it will have a role in training the algorithms that are then used on board those platforms. And of course, when we're discussing the introduction of advanced quantum technologies in things like defense, 
What are the main ethical considerations and security challenges that need to be addressed here, would you say? Um, and I'd, I'd probably talk to those slightly separately in terms of the ethical challenges and the security considerations. The, on the security side, probably the biggest one is the thing I mentioned earlier around future-proofing uh, cryptography. Um, because whilst things may not be crackable today, we are starting to open up and see a route to how conventional techniques today could be um, challenged by these technologies in the future. And we need to respond to that in a very timely way to make sure you know we protect uh, that future information in, in, in that, that period of time. So those kind of security challenges, I think, are, are very real. And a lot of people are spending you know, a lot of high value time yeah, making sure that we deal with those appropriately. On the ethical side, um, I, I don't think there's anything in quantum technologies that change the ethical framework we use within you know, the technology environment within defence. Um, they do open up new challenges, as you said, you know, better information, better positioning, better sensing, which means the ability to see more, learn more, do more. Um, but ultimately, you know, in all these areas, we we look at the technology, we understand the potential for that technology in, in armed conflict. Um, we seek to understand the risks of that technology not doing or behaving as we expect it to. Um, and then you know, we advertise those and we ensure that we, we keep our customers and our armed services informed such that they can make you know, very sound decisions on how best to use those technologies. So that the ethical framework, I think, stays stays the same in many instances if we talk about the things we've talked about quantum technologies you're providing more certainty to those decision makers you know you're more clear where you are where your assets are you're more clear about what you can see so in a lot of instances i think quantum technologies help with those ethical challenges because they provide more clarity and remove uncertainty from those from, from the people making you know, the value judgments on, on how best to act given, you know, the, the circumstances they might find themselves in. And again, for obvious reasons, I know you're not going to be able to share too much with people listening in 165 countries to us today, but is, is there anything you can share about how BAE Systems is integrating quantum technologies with existing defence systems and, and some of the challenges in that integration process? Uh, yes, yeah, so currently um, we're in the experimentation phase. Um, we are... Um, working on integrating quantum clocks uh, with some of our signal processing uh, capabilities and things like radar, um, and that allows us to you know, improve the performance of, of that radar. Um, we're looking at integrating uh, inertial measurement units to give us some understanding of uh, how they perform uh, for navigation on board platforms. At the moment, I think you know that those certainly on the on the navigation side. We're learning, and we're learning around those integration challenges. They they currently are really around size and power, and and well, size mainly, and and how we um, physically house those devices. But equally, we know that the experimentation experimental sensors we're we're using at the moment aren't representative of what those future packaging solutions will be. Um, so, I think we are. Seeking at the moment, we can see the performance of the sensors in isolation. Um, we're seeking to understand, does that change when we put them on board platforms? And are there things that will feed back into the sensor design to allow them to maintain their performance when they're used in anger? Um, and out of that, we get a better idea of those integration challenges. Um, we're probably not yet in the position where we are using those technologies certainly the two instances that I, I, I mentioned in operational capabilities, but we're very much experimenting to understand the route to getting there. And if we dare to look into the future, are there any future developments and capabilities in quantum technologies that, that particularly excite you and, and your colleagues? And, and how do you think they'll shape the future of defence too? And um, I think the big, yeah, the, the big advantage that it's offering is if you look at the quantum computing world, we use at the moment, um, I guess, what I would call design validation tools. So we, we do a bunch of design, then we analyze that design to understand, is it going to do what we thought it would do? Um, and then often through that process, you realize that it won't, and we go back through an iteration process to, 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 to improve things. 
the quantum computing power and the ability to model really brings the ability to to bring that into an inline real time design optimization process such that we are using those as our design tools to create designs whether they are you know better materials whether they are more optimized structural designs or whether they are yeah algorithms for, for ai behaviors the the promise of quantum computing to accelerate our ability to understand and optimize those designs and feed those into the systems we develop um that i think is probably the most game changing um opportunity especially when you look at the interaction between quantum computing and how we train ai um is massively computationally heavy to train complex ai systems like neural networks um quantum computing gives us the promise of being able to do that very much as a as a real time design process in the future um and as you do that i think you'll start to see you know the evolution of capability accelerate significantly and if we step away from defense for a moment are there any potential civilian applications for the quantum technologies that you're developing and how can those technologies be adapted for non-military use too yeah, I mean, there's this huge, huge civil um, application. I mean, um, you know, if you look at what UK government's announced around their their quantum defense, uh, quantum technology program, um, a lot of the use cases in there are are commercial because there's, there's there's massive commercial value and there's massive economic value for the country if we can grow on the you know the the S and T leadership position we have at the moment to become an industrial leader in quantum technologies. Um, some of the use cases, um, huge use cases in pharmaceuticals. You know, we talked about quantum computing uh, being very powerful when you're ma- when you are um, analysing fundamental chemistry. So, you know, huge opportunity in, in pharmaceuticals. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity in things like um, mineral surveying. So, you look at kind of gravi- the the gravimetric sensor- sensors being able to pick up. Um, materials of different densities underground. Um, so whether that's things like oil and gas, or whether that's other rare minerals that are particularly high in density, there's a lot of opportunities there. Um, a lot of opportunity in the financial technology markets, um, where we start to look at again, kind of optimizing processing algorithms around financial trading, um, and a lot in in that market as well around the security side of cryptography, how we keep information secure. Um, you know, the entire banking industry relies on all of our personal banking information being kept very secure from from those who might want to do nefarious things with it. Um, you know, quantum technologies have the potential uh, for real benefit and application in those markets as well. So, to be honest, the commercial applications of of quantum technologies dwarf the the defence applications. Um, what we will be seeking to do in defence is to understand how that is moving forwards and how we make the best use of those commercial drivers um, for the products and capabilities that we seek to offer. Well, I love chatting with you today. We have talked at length about quantum technology and its role in so many serious and commercial aspects. But before I let you go, it's time to have a little bit of fun with you. I always like to ask my guests if there is a book that has inspired you that we can add to our Amazon wish list for listeners to check out, or a song that we can add to our Spotify playlist. Guilty pleasures are allowed, but all I'm going to ask is, what would you like to leave everyone listening with, and why? Uh, for me, I I would like to leave you with uh, with Walls from uh, Rag and Bone Man. Um, he, he's an artist that I I just love. Uh, I'm lucky enough to see him live. Um, a local music venue, which I'll give a little plug to, down at Dreamland in Margate. Um, they've they've brought started into doing um, open air music concerts, which is fantastic. But the guy is just such a natural performer and he is so easy on stage to listen to. Um, and, and that, for, for me, is probably uh, is certainly my favourite song out of his portfolio. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyone who listens to the song, uh, I think we'll get to spend three enjoyable minutes. Um, and if you ever get a chance to see him live, then uh, I would encourage you to take the chance. Love it. I'll get that added straight to our um, Spotify playlist. and. So much we covered today. And for anyone listening, just wanting to uh, dig a little bit deeper, find out more information, contact you or your team, where's the best starting point to to find out more information about this? Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, go to our website, uh, basystems.com forward slash innovators. 
Uh, you find email link on on that website. But uh, if you want to email us directly, it's ctocons, C-O-N-N-S, at basystems.com. Well, a huge thank you for coming on the podcast today. We covered so much in 30 minutes from the potential for quantum to herald in a, a new era of defence capabilities. What you're doing there in the quantum space right now and future developments, future capabilities, including so many uh, real-world examples. Just a big thank you for taking the time to share that with me today. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. So as we conclude our insightful discussion, it's evident to me that the landscape of defence and security is undergoing a monumental shift. The role of advanced technologies like quantum computing in defence isn't just transformative, it's paramount. But I'm curious, how do you think these advancements will shape the future of global defence strategies? Are we entering a new era of technological warfare and how prepared are we to face its challenges? Please share your thoughts and join the dialogue now in how technology is redefining the art of defence and security in the 21st century. Email me, techblogwriteroutlook.com, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, just at Neil C. Hughes. Let's keep this conversation going. And on that thought, thanks for listening as always. And until next time, don't be a stranger. <laughs>